on this episode of the Jeff Does Vegas podcast. At the time that the, the third refused article came through in an email, I was sitting at the Tropicana at the lounge with um, two people that were about to launch a show there. And uh, we're getting a little tipsy and having a great time. And they're telling me all about their plans for this show. And I looked down at my phone and saw that this email had come through where that my third article had been rejected. And I slammed down my glass, excused myself. I said, I'm sorry, I've got to go back to my hotel. Went back to my room, registered the Vegas Unfiltered domain name, took those three articles that had been tossed, published them out immediately, and just kept running with it from there. Las Vegas. It's more than just a city. It's a feeling. It's that feeling of excitement when you spot the lights of the strip out the airplane window. It's that feeling of awe as you stroll down the boulevard, taking in the sights and sounds. And it's that feeling of satisfaction knowing that you're in the greatest city in the world. Over 42 million people from around the world share that feeling every year. And I'm one of them. Taking you to the world famous Vegas Strip and beyond, my name is Jeff. And this is the Jeff Does Vegas Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 89 of the Jeff Does Vegas Podcast. Before we get going for this episode of the show, I want to thank my guest from the last episode, Jonathan Jossel, the CEO of the Plaza Hotel and Casino in downtown Las Vegas. It was an absolute pleasure chatting with Jonathan. We talked about his pre-Vegas life and what led to him taking over the plaza, what he thinks has ignited renewed interest in downtown Las Vegas, some of the plaza's niche experiences, and much more. If you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, jump into the archives at jeffdoesvegas.com or head to wherever you get your podcasts and search out episode number 88, my special guest, Jonathan Jossel. All right, here we go. On to the show. Probably biased, definitely honest. Sam Novak, my guest for this episode of the podcast, has been using that tagline over the last few years for his blog, Vegas Unfiltered. Sam has become known around Las Vegas as the guy who isn't scared to share his opinion. Whether it's a show, a restaurant, hotel, or any other Vegas attraction, if it's a disastrous steaming pile of crap wrapped in a train wreck of a dumpster fire, Sam will tell you exactly that. However, if it's worth your time and money and he thinks you should check it out, he'll tell you that as well. Sam and I talked about what inspired him to create Vegas Unfiltered. We reminisced about some of the more savage reviews he's given for Vegas shows. He shared his thoughts on the changing Vegas entertainment scene and much more. Please enjoy my conversation with Sam Novak. Grew up in western Pennsylvania, kind of a dying steel town and uh, I became a nomad as soon as I got my uh, my college degree I was like let me get out of here so I bounced around doing different jobs and uh, I always kind of joked that as soon as I mastered something or got bored with it I changed careers completely so I went from being a retail manager to a movie theater manager then I started working as a licensed massage therapist down in the Miami Fort Lauderdale area did that for a few years moved to Central Florida and started working in a medical office as a referral specialist and uh, moved to uh, Oregon and got a job working in an amusement park for a little while and uh, started coming to Vegas maybe around 2006. It was like a surprise trip that my spouse arranged for me and uh, didn't even really like it at the time. It was just a bit overwhelming for me because I was a little little small town guy and as soon as I landed uh, off the plane and saw all those lights I was it was kind of like walking through Times Square you know your first time in New York City it's like you can either handle it or you can't right and I couldn't I, I, I almost was eager to get home so we were, we were only here for a few days and yet as soon as I got back I couldn't stop thinking about it so those uh, once every six month trips started becoming every three months then became monthly and I started uh, visiting uh, message boards where you could uh, read advice by other visitors, you know, what to do, what not to do, what ways to pack, things to visit while you're there. 
and I started hopping on once I felt I had enough uh, uh, of a knowledge base and experience to start sharing my tips with other people. And I got approached by uh, an editor of a website called Vegas Chatter, uh, who was looking for someone to come aboard, and she liked the way that I wrote my, you know, my little paragraphs of advice and thought I could do it professionally. And then from the Vegas Chatter website, you moved on to what your focus has been for the last couple of years now, which is the Vegas Unfiltered blog, which I have to say I am a massive fan of um, because, as the name implies, it it is unfiltered. And we'll get to the unfiltered part in, in, a, in a minute or two here. Um, <laughs> but what led to the creation of Vegas Unfiltered? Where did that come from? Um, it was launched out of frustration and a few cocktails, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, Isn't that how all good stories start, though? Frustration yeah, and a few cocktails? <laughs> especially in Las Vegas, yeah. Uh, I was, um, I, I had been on board with uh, Vegas Chatter for quite a while. They were, they were uh, their parent comp, uh, company is Condé Nast Travel Network. Very revered, very sophisticated. So, um I had to kind of reel in some of my more colorful opinions and uh, write for others. And when, when it collapsed, I got approached by one of our regular readers who thought it might be fun to kind of do a, like a, um, a guerrilla style knockoff of it, uh, which I, I was like, okay, yeah, we'll keep doing, I can keep doing what I've been doing, but adding to it and you know, adding a little Tabasco to it. And um, that was fun for a while, but uh, it lacked the cohesiveness that I liked about Vegas Chatter. We had all these different writers that were that we didn't communicate with one another. There was no direction, no guidance, and I, I kind of got frustrated with that. So I was looking for another website where I could still give my uh, uh, un, unfiltered opinions without uh, feeling like I was floating in a sea of nonsense. I got a few different uh, um, editors who had asked me to come on board. And I always told them, make sure you know exactly how I flow before you offer me anything. And, oh, yeah, we know you. We, we've read your stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> um, I, I, I signed on for this one website uh, after I left the second one. And... Um, wrote one very fluffy article just to introduce myself. And it was mostly with a, a, a senior readership from what I could tell. And after that first one, I, I presented three more that were more in my own personal style. And uh, every one of them was, oh, no, we can't, we can't publish this. This is negative. I'm like, it's not negative. It's honest. It's a bad show. It's a bad restaurant. And uh, the response was, well, we exist to draw people here. And I didn't, wasn't on board for that. Um, I, I was like, you promised I could write whatever I wanted without any uh, constraints. And you're not keeping that promise. So I'm out of here. At the time that uh, my third article, uh, the, the third refused article came through in an email, I was sitting at the Tropicana at the lounge there in the casino with um, two people that were about to launch a show there. One was uh, the MC and the other was a financier and producer. And uh, we're getting a little tipsy and having a great time. And they're telling me all about their plans for this show. And I looked down at my uh, phone and saw that this email had come through where that my third article had been rejected. And I slammed down my glass, excused myself. I said, I'm sorry, I've got to go back to my hotel. Went back to my room registered uh, the Vegas Unfiltered domain name, took those three articles that had been tossed, published them out immediately, and just kept running with it from there. That's amazing. I love that. And one of the things that uh, I love about your blog, as I said, I'm a huge fan of Vegas Unfiltered because of your honesty. Um, I don't want to say you don't care, because obviously you do care, but what you don't care about is, or what it at least seems that you don't care about is 
upsetting the big corporations or or the big show producers there's so many other vegas content creators that are either vegas based or otherwise who really do appear to be in the pocket of some of those corporations and casino owners and 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 um show producers and such whereas you when you put a review out there, I mean, it's there's there's times that it is I will I will come right out and say it it's pretty savage, quite frankly. I, I think that uh, anybody who's coming here deserves to know exact truths, and most of the people that you're referring to, um, half the time that they spend is going to free shows, eating free dinners, you know, kissing up and getting. As long as they keep writing positive things, they're going to keep getting more and more invitations to go back. Um, that's that's buying a good review, and uh, I never felt there was a need to do that. Somebody sends me an invitation, of course I'm going to take it, but uh, they need to know what they're going to get into if they've invited me, because if the show sucks, I'm going to say so. I uh, actually had to face that just uh, last month, where um, I was invited to a show, it was an existing show that had moved to a different location. And while I was sitting there waiting for the show to begin, I looked down at my emails and the PR person, uh, one of the PR reps for the company that was representing the show, um, emailed me saying, oh, I, I see that you're at our show. Uh, we want to send over some cocktails <laughs> to you. <laughs> and um, I, I waited till after the show was over before I responded. I, I can buy my own cocktails. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and the show was just as awful as it ever was. And I did write back saying, thank you for the offer, but um, the show still sucks. I'm not going to say anything nice about it. And um, keep me in mind <laughs> when you open up a better show. <laughs> and um, they had their big official opening party just, I think, two weekends ago. And oddly enough, I wasn't on the invitation. <laughs> Funny how that works. Um, something that I, I appreciate that you touched on is that you take the approach in that you want people to know what they're getting themselves into. I mean, I consider myself quite lucky in that I visit Vegas, or at least I did visit Vegas quite frequently. So for me, if I go out to a show and it sucks, it's like, well, you know what? I'll be back again shortly. I can go see something else. But for someone who maybe isn't a frequent visitor to the city and somebody who is going out there spending their limited hard earned vacation budget dollars on a show. If they go out and drop 50 bucks on a show and it's absolutely terrible. The last thing you want is to think, well, damn, that was a waste of $50. That was really disappointing. And that can happen a lot here uh, with, with dozens upon dozens of shows. They're not all going to be winners. Um, and people don't have the luxury of having someone, you know, on their shoulder, whispering in their ear saying, don't go see that one. Mm -hmm. I can be that person for you. If you <laughs> give me the time to say so, cause I do see a lot of different shows and many of them are fantastic. Some are one of a kind that absolutely must be seen. And then there are others that I don't know how they even have the, the conscience to step out on stage knowing that they're throwing 75 minutes of absolute garbage in front of people and collecting their money for it. Mm -hmm. Case in point, uh, Cirque du Soleil's run over at uh, Luxor, which we, <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to sooner or later. Oh, we will absolutely 100% get there because I, I want to have that conversation uh, about that show and, and some of the other uh, savage reviews that you've written on on some big productions. But um, first off, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but something that I mean, from my own personal experience in going to Vegas and having friends that that work in the entertainment industry and the hospitality industry there, I know that it is a very, very small world and everybody knows everybody have you run into any situations where um you have upset or offended any friends like you've written a, a particularly negative review about a show or a performance and gotten that message or that text or that phone call from somebody going like dude you're killing us here um absolutely um yeah i've been confronted a few times i've never really aside from that 
non-invitation that I mentioned a little bit ago. I've never really been blackballed from any place or, or told you're not welcome. I, I've decided to do that on my own when I've seen continuous garbage flowing out of a certain entity or, or resource. And I'll be like, you know, you've had enough chances. Uh-huh. Give it up. I'm I'm done even, you know, trying trying to give you chances. But um, I've had a few times where people have confronted me in public or written to me um, late at night in a direct message, normally when they've been intoxicated themselves. <laughs> and there's, you know, um, I, I'm kind of like, I don't want to say I'm a night owl, but I'll go to sleep early and get up in the middle of the evening, like maybe two or three in the morning and start writing, which is when I'm most creative. And it seems that that's usually the time when I'll start getting these messages from people who are obviously, you know, hitting last call and for whatever reason decided I pissed them off and they start messaging me. Well, I'm wide awake and they probably don't even have a recollection of what they said the next morning, but I certainly do. (laughs) I've always maintained that smartphones and email programs um, should have some kind of breathalyzer slash ignition lock on them to uh, (laughs) prevent this from that kind of thing from happening. Cause, cause we've all been there. We've all done it and we've all had it done to us. And, uh, (laughs) Um, we briefly touched on, on how, um, savage some of your reviews can be. And maybe, maybe savage is too harsh of a word. Maybe honest is a, is a better word. So uh, what I kind of wanted to do was play, um, almost like a, a word association game with you, Sam, kind of, uh, essentially I'll throw out the name of uh, a show that garnered a particularly honest review from you one of my favorites and um and we'll we'll chat about that so let's start with one of your personal favorites i know you love this one cirque du soleil's very short-lived show run Mm, 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 mm. well the concept alone was was a failure Uh, when you have all these people that have launched landmark productions sitting in a room saying yeah this is a good idea um, <laughs> I, had they run out of good ideas and this is what they were filling in it with? I have no idea. It, it was, if you've ever been to, um, like Disney's, uh, um, park in Orlando, the, the movie studio park where mm-hmm. they have stunt shows around Indiana Jones and now they have a fast and furious one. It was kind of like that. The, the things that you sit down in a chair to watch when you're, too hot and tired from standing in a, in a ride line. That's all it was. It was right. time filler that they spent $60 million on and their whole reputation on the line for. And it was just so bad. And, and the idea of a movie come alive could have been a great one. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, even when I wrote my review for that one, I said that it's not unsalvageable. They, they could have gone back to the drawing board and said, okay, we've got a basic concept here that might appeal to people, but let's make it worth seeing. They could have attached um, like maybe a lesser action star, like maybe Jean-Claude Van Damme. You know, he was big in the 90s, not so big today, probably could use a nice paycheck. Still a draw, people know his name. Build an action show around an actual movie star Mm -hmm. and then call it Movies Coming to Life. That could have worked. Mm-hmm. But instead, they had uh, this this guy who looked like a meth head himself, probably 90 pounds soaking wet. He's supposed to be this big action har- star, kind of like a Dwayne Johnson, you know, running around this stylized version of Las Vegas being chased by gangsters. And uh, it was just really, really wrong. There were there were so many things in that show that never should have been performed on a on a, a stage for mass consumption. They had a guy who was hung over the audience by hooks into his nose. Um, they had a contortionist who simulated being tortured and having his bones broken live on stage. Um, the, the, the main character is strapped into a wheelchair and they shoot him up with drugs to interrogate him. People in the audience were screaming, getting up, walking out. Um, a friend of mine who went to a different performance than I did during one of the torture sequences, he actually passed out. He was so in shock by it that he literally passed out 
it was abominable in every way. Ah, yeah, yeah. This sounds like the, the worst fever dream in the history of fever dreams. Like I, I can't understand who would have ever thought this was a, a good concept for a, for a show. It sounds like a Saturday night live skit where, uh, where they're spoofing Cirque du Soleil. You know, we've, we've done Michael Jackson. We've done the Beatles. We've done Chris Angel. How can we fuck it up now? <laughs> and do something so awful. <laughs> And that's what they did. Um, on to another one of your favorites, Magic Mike Live. Uh, let me get a Pepto Bismol. <laughs> the difference between Run and Magic Mike Live, aside from the fact that they're both steaming piles of shit, <laughs> is that one is popular and one tanked really badly. Mm -hmm. Why Magic Mike Live continues to be popular, I, I can't guess because it's a male review. It's marketed as a male review. It's based on two movies about male strippers, but you would need a stopwatch and a magnifying glass to find any male strippers in the show. They're here and there, and they almost never take anything off. They just dance around with suits and ties, and every now and then uh, somebody will whip off their shirt, and then the female host comes back on and makes more dirty jokes for another 15 minutes. <laughs> it's not funny. It's not entertaining. It's not creative. It's reverse misogynistic because it's man hating. It slurs and slanders men up one side and down the other. I don't know how that would be considered entertaining. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guys themselves, I'm no prize. Okay. I look in the mirror every day. I know I am no prize. I'm sorry. Some of these guys are butt ugly. <laughs> <laughs> They're skinny. They got. They're all, some of them are like really super hairy, which is, you never see that in a male review. It's just, it's considered kind of, I don't know, um, unsanitary, mm -hmm. you know, um, to have guys with back hair and all sweaty walking around in amongst the audience members. You, you don't want to see that shit. Um, bad skin. Um, some of them actually smell bad. I mean, they're that close that, you know, they walk by and you catch them down when you're covering your nose. I'm not exaggerating. And last but not least, another one of your uh, your personal favorites, Chris Angel. Uh -uh. <laughs> I, I I think that reaction pretty much um, pretty much says it all, Sam. Um, but I mean, in all honesty, I mean, frankly, I have never understood the allure and appeal of Chris Angel. Uh, and I'm talking all the way back to the the mind freak days on on A and E when that show was a thing, and I mean I'm a fan of magic. I'm a fan of magicians. I've been to several illusionist shows in Las Vegas and elsewhere, and I've always had a great time. But with Chris Angel, I just I I do not get it. He had ten years uh, uh, at Luxor with Cirque du Soleil, and then uh, in all honesty, they could not wait to get rid of him. They were they were stuck in an ironclad tenure contract with him. They hated working with him, absolutely hated. In fact, um, I just did an expose on him a couple of months ago um, where he took $11 million in government handouts. And um, I got contacted by one of the higher ups in Cirque du Soleil, um, a very high up exec who said, thank you for that. Oh my God, I'm just sitting here with a glass in my hand, sipping back and watching the action happen. Take him down. We all freaking hated him. He is such an asshole and rotten to everybody. So while he continues to have a following and uh, have another show on the strip, I don't know, because everybody knew how awful that show was. Uh, how many versions of it did you see? Fortunately for me, I never saw any of them. <laughs> Because I knew um, how terrible it was. As I said, I was I was never a big fan anyway, so I wasn't going to just go and see the show just because. But I recall hearing how bad it was when it first initially opened. If I'm not mistaken, they opened the show and then very quickly because it was a it was a full on Cirque du Soleil show when it first opened up and then they very quickly revamped the show or did some some changes to it to make it slightly less Cirque. Am I am I correct in that? Right. Um, it went through three official revisions, um, one name change, 
Um, the first version of it was very Cirque du Soleil with dancers and acrobatics, um, costume characters, dancing bunnies. Um, it was really bizarre. And he sang too. Oh my God. <laughs> he sang the mind freak song during the show. Um, there were maybe about two months of that where they were changing it almost every week um, during the soft opening. And they were asking people not to re uh, release reviews for it, but they, they were just flowing out where everybody's saying what an atrocity it was. But they, they, they kind of tightened it up a little bit, but it was still a, a Cirque du Soleil show when they first officially opened it. And it still had the dancers and the singers and all the musical numbers and all the special effects that Cirque is known for. You can think of, say, in Beatles Love, where they have that big sheet that comes out over the audience. They had elaborate things like that within the show. Still got awful reviews, kind of limped for about three years, maybe a little bit less, where they threw all the Cirque du Soleil out. They got rid of the live band. They got rid of the singers, the dancers. It was just him, a few characters, um, a few visual backdrops, but it went back to straight magic and not a Cirque du Soleil type of show. It was still owned by Cirque, and uh, they advertised it as such. Still was awful. I walked out of that one the second time, giving it a try about halfway through. Went, went out to the lobby. Um, there were a number of failed illusions that were going on, and you could see him stumble through, and uh, you can see the wires. You could see the trap doors. He's just, he wasn't good on stage. He was never meant to be on stage. Anybody who knows uh, his TV shows, it's all editing, paid extras, camera angles. You can't pull that kind of thing off on, on, on a live stage without smoke and mirrors, literally. So he, he was setting up uh, an illusion, Something went awry, the curtain went down, the lights came up, and their announcers kept saying over and over, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, remain in your seats. The show will resume at any moment. About 20 minutes passed. And when the curtain came back up, it was a completely different backdrop. And he goes, well, did you enjoy the intermission? And just started into the next thing, no explanation. At that point, I got up, I walked out into the lobby, and I asked to speak to a manager. And this woman came walking over to me with this head hung low and her shoulders slumped. And you know she got this all the time. And I said, this show's absolute garbage. I've seen it so many times. It just keeps getting worse. I'm done. And she had a, 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 this form in her pocket, a stack of them, actually, which Lord only knows how many of <laughs> these she passed out. She's like, you have to take, it, take care of it this way. And uh, you had to call up Cirque du Soleil, wait for them to call you back. And all they would do is offer you a discounted price on a different Cirque show. Wouldn't give any refunds or anything like that. Then there was a third version of it. <laughs> oh my God. Third time's the charm, Sam. Third time's the yeah. charm. <laughs> the third one was actually kind of an apology. And I went to the press uh, night for that one. They, that's when they changed the show from Believe to Mind Freak Live. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, it was a completely different show once more. Still bad. Um, before the show began, he came out, spoke to the audience and said, I, I know most of you here absolutely hate me. And you've written really awful things about me, but I'm a changed person. I want you to give me a fair chance as if you haven't seen anything here before. And just write about what I'm presenting this evening as opposed to how you feel about me in the past. Okay. It's still stunk. And the last... 10 minutes or so of the show, magic is thrown out the window. All the entertainment is thrown out the window. And he just starts lecturing the audience about his experiences with uh, pediatric cancer because his, his son has cancer. Mm -hmm. I could go off on the side and tell you that at one point he denied that this child was even his, but the moment that the child developed cancer, suddenly it's his and he's an activist and and he's actually begging people in the audience for money, for donations, passing around the bucket to ticket buyers during this show. And I'm thinking to myself, he's got all these million dollar motorcycles in glass cases out in the lobby. Why doesn't he just sell a couple of those instead of asking his ticket buyers to hand over their money? Now, in the meantime, while he's got this video on the back of the screen showing children in hospital beds with their no hair on their heads and clinging to their stuffed animals. On both sides of the stage, he's got women spinning around on stripper poles. And I thought run was awful. Holy cow. 
interestingly enough, they're in the same auditorium. Yeah. <laughs> and they replaced awful with the worst possible. Oh my Luxor God. and Cirque du Soleil do not go together. No kidding. What a disaster. Wow. Um, okay. Let's, let's step away from the savagery and the negativity for a bit here. Um, you have recently uh, gotten yourself paired up with the folks at Vegas411.com. Um, you have uh, signed on as the deputy editor for Vegas411.com, which is uh, very cool. Congratulations for that. How did you get connected with Vegas411? They actually approached me just like uh, my first writing job here in Vegas. Um, I guess my reputation preceded itself. And uh, the, the gentleman who offered me the job, his wife is an avid reader of my column. And uh, she said, she kept, she kept nudging him. You've got to get him on your team. Get him on your team. Lure him in. Well, I, I get a lot of um, messages and emails from companies all the time. And what sounds like job offers is usually uh, investment requests. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't give this one very much credibility. I was like, you know, I'm sorry. I, uh, I just bought a condo in Puerto Vallarta. My money's tied up. I, I'm not looking to you know, help join up anybody else's company. And the response was, you've got it all wrong. We want to pay you <laughs> for what you're doing already in your reputation. Yeah. And usually when things sound too good to be true, they are not this time. This time it was legit. They asked me out to dinner at a very, very nice restaurant that I would never afford. <laughs> on my own. Sat there for hours talking about what was expected of me, what, what they would want me to do. And it was pretty much the things I've already been doing. Just be myself, honest opinions, go out and cover events uh, represent the company and give it a little bit of flair. And I, I, I tend to be a bit on the colorful side. So look like these are all things I can do. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I've been at ever since uh, writing more articles than I ever have before. The re it's nice to, to be on a platform where that already had a built-in readership. And um, I can still be a part of a team that's moving forward, but also have my own, perspective. Everybody has their own, but we're all moving forward. And that's what I've been looking for the whole time I've been doing this. So it's been fun. And uh, they also want me to be the official face of the website, which once again, is kind of scary, but uh, <laughs> they seem to like what I'm doing so far. You kind of briefly touched on this with Vegas 411. Something very cool that they have asked of you is to continue being you right? They, they haven't asked you to make any changes to the way you're writing or change your opinions or, you know, dial it back a, a bit because, you know, oh, these are people that may want to spend money with us and we don't want to chase them away. They've, they've not done that at all. Exactly the direct opposite. Um, it was, it was kind of a, a, a don't hold back because of us do more because of us. Um, uh, the, the gentleman who hired me, he, he likes to remain anonymous, so I, don't, I won't discuss who it is, but he mentions, mentioned a lot of people here in town that write that fluff. He said, uh, as a person who lives in the city, I'm freaking sick of it. Nobody tells things honestly the way that you do. And his, it was the same philosophy. People deserve to know. Um, don't hold back. People, people have only have so much, so much amount of money to spend. Um, let's, let's let them know what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. You're, you know, through your own eyes, of course. But if they've been following you this long, they already know what your philosophies are. Knock it out of the ballpark. And um, they also want me to to ra raise this a little bit of a stink on the on the dirty players here in town, which I've been able to do for the past few months. Um, there's so many hardworking, honest people in Las Vegas, but there are a few really sketchy, money-grubbing, backstabbing individuals um, that are harmful to our reputation as a community and to show business as a whole mm -hmm. that um, I've been encouraged to call them out, bring them down, and, and make way for the good entertainers, the, the, the valuable ones that care about their audiences. And I like that you're bringing attention to those, 
smaller independent shows and smaller independent performers. I think so much focus has been put on the giant quote unquote residencies. And I've been saying for the last couple of years now, I think that um, Vegas is playing fast and loose with the term residency. Um, You know, four shows in a month, every three months does not a residency make in my opinion, but that's a a topic of discussion for another day. Um, But those residency stars who are making millions and millions of dollars, whether it's Britney Spears or Bruno Mars or Gwen Stefani or Lady Gaga. Yes. Not to take anything away from their talents and abilities, but when you compare it to the artists who are doing eight shows or nine shows a week and busting it, it's, it's nice to see that they have somebody on their side. I think that's why, um, even though I can be a little bit salty, I've been kind of taken in by the entertainment community because I know personally dozens upon dozens of these people. I know their stories. I know their backgrounds. I know how hard they work and the things that they have to do on the side just to make ends meet. Um, they'll take bartending jobs. They will park cars or do Uber. I know of one entertainer who had a huge um, resident show on the Las Vegas Strip. And after it closed, he resorted to donating plasma just so that he could pay his rent. And you hear things like that, and it, it just hits you in the heart. Um, most of the, 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 the performers in large-scale shows, they'll be lucky if they make 100 or $120 per performance. And you've got somebody like Britney Spears who walks out on the stage, moving her lips, flapping her arms, shaking her hair, while all the people around her are dancing and doing the real work, and she gets millions. Mm-hmm. So um, I've always been an advocate for, for the little guy, the ones with true talent who can sing and dance at the same time and act in the midst of all that and run from this particular show, hop out of their costume, get in their car and run down the strip to another show and hop on that stage and do that for another 90 minutes. It's amazing how hard some of these entertainers work. So um, most of the really, really high ticket entertainers, When they get to the point where they're just sleepwalking through their performance and collecting all the dough, sure, they've they've earned their reputation, but they're not giving it their all anymore. They're just cashing paychecks. So it's kind of hard as a fan of entertainment and an advocate of entertainers to continue to brag about these huge shows, knowing that everybody's doing the hard work for them and the people way down at the bottom are living two or three in an apartment just so they could stay here in the city. Which kind of leads into the next thing that I wanted to ask about Um, is something that we've seen recently, and this was happening pre pandemic shutdown, but maybe seems to be happening even more so now um, as things have begun to open up. Um, We're seeing some of these shows, the smaller scale shows moving to venues off the strip. Now, of course, barring the fact that some of these shows had this thrust upon them in what I refer to as the day the music died when Caesars cut loose a whole bunch of shows. Um, what do you think is is behind that? Is it a case of I mean, there's a, I've talked with other entertainers on this show before about what they call the four walling uh, situation where um, which I'm sure you can explain a little bit better than me, um, where performers and productions are are paying for the space they're in um but why do you think they are making that move away from the strip to some of these smaller independent non-corporate off-strip venues well you remember back when mtv first came uh into the forefront and, and society was getting ridiculed for their their short attention spans um Music videos were just one quick shot after another, packing as much information as you can into three minutes and then on to the next one. Um, That's kind of been trickling down into live entertainment where um, people don't feel like sitting in an auditorium for 75 or 90 minutes unless it is one particular thing that they really, really care about. If you're not a huge fan of, say, Lady Gaga, you might not make a big evening out of going to an expensive show. 
So when you've got these, these productions that are rolling out that cost so much money and the, 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 the return is less and less for the performers, it, it becomes impractical to have a, a big auditorium for them. Um, the four walling situation, uh, and if your listeners don't know what that means, that's where the entertainers are basically renting out the, the showroom and paying the hotel or casino for the right to use that space that's a lot of money that they have to put up front and then hope that comes back in the way of ticket sales. Mm -hmm. uh, several decades ago, the casinos, they owned the shows. They brought in the entertainers. They paid for everything. They just wanted the um, gamblers to come in, have something to do in the meantime, and flow back out into the, into the casino to spend more money. It wasn't a matter of whether that show was generating income. Now, the tides have changed. When uh, MGM and Caesars bought up all these properties, those uh, individual approaches to running a business were thrown out the window too. It's all uh, making the, um, the shareholders happy. And if the entertainers can't afford to rent that room and it's not paying off in the property space, they could do something else with that showroom. That's why Caesars was closing up all these showrooms. Oh, we'll just make more convention space out of it. But if, if a, an entertainer is going to be on the hook, they're going to look for the most affordable place they can and, uh, you know, make it as easy as they can to, to make a little bit of a profit. Right, right. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about the pandemic because, uh, quite frankly, I'm over it, as I'm sure everybody is, in spite of the fact that we're still all living through it to some degree, completely and totally over it. But Something that you've touched on in your writing is it seems like there was a bit of a missed opportunity by the the big wigs in Las Vegas, the big corporate guys to take a step back and sort of reset and reboot on the things that used to make people really happy about Vegas. And, and I'm talking about um, things like resort fees, parking fees, all these other little fees, the little bits of, of nickel and diming that people have been facing over the last little while. This was maybe an opportunity to kind of get rid of some of that so that people could come back to Vegas feeling really positive about everything. And it kind of feels like they blew it. Um. I kind of got some hope once everything shut down last March that the city would wisen up and start going back to a more affordable uh, way of presenting Vegas to the world. Um, and they did for a while. Um, parking fees were eliminated. Um, restaurant prices, they were offering a lot of specials. Hotel room rates were super, super low. Some of that backfired mm. because... Um, mostly because of the room rates being so low that it started drawing in a, a certain demographic that was very, if I dare to say this, unsophisticated. Last summer was a nightmare as far as crime, violence out on the strip, brawls, shootings, stabbings, kidnappings, robberies every single night. And uh, I didn't go down there. There was really no reason for me to anyway, because there wasn't that much that was open. Mm -hmm. Las Vegas last summer, summer 2020, was kind of like Escape from New York. It was hell. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when that became national news, I got really, really worried that people weren't going to come back at all. So uh, Caesars and MGM and Cosmo, knee-jerk reaction, Resort fees raised up, bring uh, parking fees back, jack up the price of show tickets, jack up the price of restaurants. And that's where we are again. Mm -hmm. Super expensive, no value to be had, uh, limited options. Um, most of the casinos still, good luck trying to find any place to eat after 10 p.m., which boggles the mind. We're still marketed as a 24-hour city. Um, I'll come out of a show. I went down to the, the Smith Center for the Performing Arts last weekend with a few friends to see a, a really big production down there. Uh, the show began at 645. We got out somewhere close to 10 o'clock, couldn't find a place to eat to save our soul. Even the Peppermill Restaurant, which is legendary, always a 24-hour place, Rat Pack used to eat there. They close at 11 p.m. now. 
Wow. Almost no buffet is open in the city. Um, most of the 24 hour coffee shops have gone to limited hours. Um, if you do find a place understaffed, mm -hmm. so you're going to have half hour to an hour wait, even though most of the tables are empty. Mm -hmm. um, really rough going right now. We're, we're trying to reboot ourselves, but somebody keeps hitting the restart button without anything booting up. Well, and as I say, I mean, it seemed like there was a little bit of that nickel and diming going on pre pandemic and then following the, uh, the lockdowns and the shutdowns and, and the reopening that seemed to go away and everybody seemed pretty happy about that. And it seemed to be the direction things were going and now, um, and not so much. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, it seemed like they were going to go that route. And I was really, really optimistic, but one start people started coming back. Then you started seeing at the bottom of your bill, a COVID surcharge franchise fees, all these different things were being attacked to the bottom of bills. Mm -hmm. There was no housekeeping in the hotels anymore. You'd have to go downstairs if you wanted towels. It's like all these ridiculous things that they were taking away from people and adding on to instead of saying, hey, let's throw everything at you and give you a reason to come back. They didn't do that. Um, I got into one hell of an argument over a gentleman who handles um, a lot of chef driven functions here in town. He represents a lot of very uh, interesting um, chef owned restaurants. Um, and I, I posted on my Facebook page about my objection to these, these COVID fees that were, that they were tacking on. And he said, you have no idea what restaurants are going through. I said, as a diner, I don't need to know that the businesses that I'm patronizing are suffering. If you have to raise prices, I don't want to see them itemized at the bottom of that bill. I want to know that this is the price of my entree. This is the price of my drink. This is the tax. And I will choose the gratuity. That's all I need to see. I don't want you to give me a sad story about how your restaurant is suffering while I'm paying my bill. Mm -hmm. Absorb that into your prices. That's all you need to do. I, I've always maintained that with all of those different kinds of add-on fees, whether it's, as you say, the concession and franchise or a, a service fee or a COVID fee or resort fees or any of that kind of stuff, just throw it into the bill. I mean, I get it with restaurants and small businesses um, and large businesses over the last 18 months. Everybody has suffered, but I feel like you will piss people off less if you just did a across the board 2% or 3% price hike on your menu items, as opposed to itemizing that two or 3% on the bottom of the bill. They're not, they would absolutely, they would not notice it. I mean, cause if, if a salad that you got the last time was 1399 and this, this time it's 1599, that was six months ago. A lot of water's gone under the bridge. You're glad to be back in Vegas. Oh, hey, was that, did that go up $2? No, you're not going to notice that. It seems so simple, seems so obvious. And yet that's lost in this city, very much lost. And there are people that get paid to sit around and decide these things. Mm -hmm. And they think they're good ideas. Oh, sure. The customers won't care if we raise the resort fee by another $10. Mm -hmm. We won't, we won't give them anything for it, but we're just going to let them know that effective such and such, they're going to be paying $45 on top of their $45 room rate. Well, and I sometimes wonder too, with, with the big corporations running things, you're just a number. You're just a customer. You're not Mr. Novak or Mr. Walker. For the most part, the average person is just customer 175272. And the way they look at it is, well, if this person doesn't come back, somebody else will come in to fill their spot. If you treat your customers as stupid people, you're more than likely going to lose them. Mm. Um, that's where I come in, hopefully to warn people to avoid places like that, where you're going to be treated like an idiot and send you in directions of places that are going to value you as a customer, as a guest, it's going to welcome you and give you more than you expected. Mm. We, there, there are still places here in town that care about you coming to visit us mm. and they want to go above and beyond to make your experience special. There are places like that in I'm going to be standing right behind him saying, come on over here. Come on over here. 
we don't we don't want to be ripped off and we don't want to be the ones ripping people off either my 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 job here in town relies on the tourism industry there's a magician here in town his name is david goldrake he he was a a, a a big fan of my column and when i was looking for a slogan he threw this one at me that stuck he said probably biased definitely honest i put that on my business cards i i, I rented a um uh, one of those mobile billboards when I first launched, and it said it right there on it. You, you can lean towards the places that you prefer and, and, and you have a personal attachment to, but be honest with people and, and they'll be happy. You don't have to lie and deceive them. Sam, if uh, people want to learn more about you, read more of your stuff, um, where can they find you online? How do they go about doing that? Uh, well, right now, everything's being directed over to Vegas411.com. You can find any of my articles there. If you click on my name, it'll give you a whole list of the ones that I'm currently publishing on that site. Um, I've got dozens upon dozens that are that are still kind of noteworthy and worth checking out at my existing site, uh, which is uh, VegasUnfilteredBlog.com. And I also have a Facebook page for that site, the Vegas Unfiltered Blog Facebook page. Um, I write in for a few other outlets. There's a um, print magazine called A Chic Compass, which is relatively new, and I'll write entertainment articles for them. And um, I've got a bunch on the uh, website for LasVegasMagazine.com and also BestOfVegas.com. Excellent. Well, Sam, again, I um, I really appreciate this. I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, as I say, it's great to finally be able to sit and have a conversation. And uh, hopefully at some point, um, we're able to do this in person as opposed to uh, over the, the wonders of technology and <laughs> Zoom. It would be a blast to be able to sit and chat in person. Hey, I'm game. If you can uh, deal with me talking your ear for the next 90 minutes, I can do it. <laughs> I don't think that'd be a problem. I think it would be a competition to see whose ear gets talked off first, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's make a go for it. Awesome. Thanks again, Sam. I appreciate it. All right, Jeff. Thank you. Once again, if you want to check out Sam's unfiltered reviews and recommendations, you can visit Vegas411.com vegasunfilteredblog.com or look for Vegas Unfiltered on Facebook. And of course, I'll post links to all of those spots in the show notes at jeffdoesvegas.com. And that wraps up another episode of the Jeff Does Vegas podcast. If you've got feedback on this episode of the show or any other episode for that matter, or you've got suggestions and ideas for topics you'd like me to cover on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to me via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Jeff Does Vegas, or drop me an email directly at Jeff at Jeff Does In the meantime, thank you so much for checking out the show. Be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcast so you'll know the moment new episodes are available. And don't forget to visit JeffDoesVegas.com for past episodes and show notes. The Jeff Does Vegas podcast is a Walker New Media production.